headlines that describe bias in medical research and, in the worst cases, fraud. It's not just journalists that are contributing to this kind of criti critical genre. Here are several titles, book titles, written by academics and phys uh, physicians. The books on the left are worried about what critics take to be spurious disease categories, diseases like attention deficit disorder or depression or female sexual dysfunction. The books in the middle are worried about the drugs themselves, uh, what critics take to be highly ineffective or harmful interventions. And the books on the right are worried about the nefarious role of industry in performing uh, medical research. These aren't cranky outsiders, so these are some of the most prominent physicians um, in the world today. So this title, for instance, Marsha Angel. Uh, Angel was the chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for many years. Um, the book uh, in the corner here is uh, by our colleague David Healy, who's standing at the back. Uh, ben Goldacre, uh, many of you know as a prominent uh, journalist and physician here in England. Uh, Goldacre took an extract from this book and published it in The Guardian, um, titled his article, The Drugs Don't Work. Uh, so these, these authors are articulating several um, different kinds of criticisms about medicine. My personal favorite title in this genre is by the epidemiologist Peter Gutsche, who's one of Europe's most important epidemiologists. The title of his book is Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime. <laughs> I'll just read one passage from the editor of The Lancet. So The Lancet is one of the world's you know, greatest medical journals. Here's what the chief editor of The Lancet says. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. So I'm curious about this turn towards darkness. As a philosopher of science, I've made it my job in the last few years to try to make sense of this critical genre about medicine. In my view, these authors are um, contributing to a general skeptical thesis about medicine that I call medical nihilism, which is the view that we ought to have little confidence in the effectiveness of novel medical interventions. So I've just published a book titled simply Medical Nihilism, um, in which I try to bring together the various skeptical argument, arguments about medicine, assess the extent to which they're persuasive, and, um, well, the punchline is, on the whole, I find them relatively persuasive. So what I'm going to do in the next, say, 15 or 20 minutes is describe the key arguments for medical nihilism. But before I do, I want to note two rather obvious facts. One is, this kind of skepticism about medicine contradicts what appears to be a real enthusiasm about medical interventions today. So this is a, a chart that um, graphs sales of pharmaceuticals in, in the billions of dollars over the decades, and you can just see it sort of rising and rising and rising and rising. So we, the royal we, patients, physicians, policymakers, regulators, we have what seems to be an unbridled enthusiasm for medicine. Another kind of motivating fact that um, is both interesting and sort of obvious is that skepticism about medicine has been around a long time. You can dive through texts even by Hippocrates and find a lot of kind of skeptical proclamations about medicine. So here, for example, is a passage from Dryden. Better to hunt in fields for health unbought than fee the doctor for a nauseous draft. The wise for cure on exercise depend. God never made his work for man to mend. So lived our sires here. Doctors learned to kill and multiplied with theirs the weekly bill. <laughs> okay. So we see there, there's three assertions here that in fact are the three key arguments in that critical genre in those books that I just had, had up on the slide. So one is that diseases themselves are just the kinds of things that are 
in principle, futile to treat. So Dryden is saying, God never made his work for man to mend. Another is a kind of skepticism about the interventions themselves. The drafts are nauseous. You should just do some exercise. And then the third is this worry about the corrupting influence of money. They multiplied their weekly bill. So we see those three arguments appear over and over and over again through the centuries, including in this critical genre today. This is a woodcut by Goya. Goya is depicting a physician as a donkey. And the inscription says, I wonder what she's going to die from. So the doctor is treating a patient. I wonder what she's going to die from. And most commentators on this woodcut say, in fact, the patient's already dead. Now, I like this woodcut for one reason, which is Goya is a you know, transitional figure between sort of the early modern Renaissance and late modernism. And so I'm going to give you uh, another quote from the middle of the 19th century, and Goya kind of nicely ties this quote from Dryden to the quote from the middle of the 19th century. One thing that I don't like about this woodcut is that Goya is depicting the problem um, being physicians themselves. I think that that's basically a distraction when it comes to modern medicine today. So the problem, in that, the problem that motivates the arguments for medical nihilism um, really don't have to do with physicians. So it's not physicians or other healthcare workers that are responsible for the crisis of medicine today, but rather it's the tools that physicians have at their disposal and the way in which those tools get studied. So in the 19th century, it was very fashionable to be what was called a therapeutic nihilist. Here is a quote from the dean of the Harvard Medical School, who writes, If the whole materia medica could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. <laughs> That's the dean of the Harvard Medical School. OK, so medical nihilism holds that we ought to have little confidence in the effectiveness of novel medical interventions. Now, there's many, I have noted three principal arguments for skepticism about medicine. And what I try to do in my work is bring them together. Now, I use a formal framework to bring them together. Philosophers have a kind of fetish for logical formalisms, and I'm no different. So I use a, a formal tool that describes how scientists confirm their theories, and that's just a kind of glue to bring the various arguments together. So I'm going to describe that glue to you for about a minute or two. Um, but don't worry so much about this glue. It's really just a way to bring together a diverse set of arguments into a cohesive whole. Suppose you've got some hypothesis about a drug, like this drug is effective like this drug that you want to take is effective. And you've got some evidence for that drug, call it E. This is just the publicly available evidence about the drug. This could be evidence from a randomized control trial, a meta-analysis, whatever the um, evidence you've got. Philosophers like to model confidence in hypotheses in the following way, by what's called a conditional probability. The probability that this hypothesis is true, given that you've got this evidence. The handy thing about conditional probabilities is that there's a little mathematical theorem we can apply called Bayes' theorem, which gives us the following result. This is, just, this is just math. You'll just have to take my word for it. So once we've got this handy theorem on, on the page, we can use the different terms in the theorem to represent different aspects of scientific reasoning. This term is called the likelihood, which represents the impact of evidence on your hypothesis. This term is called the prior probability of the hypothesis, which is just your background belief in the hypothesis. Before you got this evidence that you, in fact, got, what's the probability that that hypothesis was true? This term, the prior probability of the evidence, represents the reliability of the methods that generated the evidence that you got. I'm going to unpack all this in a minute or two. So there's a master argument for medical nihilism, which holds that this term is low, the likelihood is low, the prior is low, and the expectancy of the evidence, the um, probability of the evidence is high. That all entails that this term that represents your confidence in the hypothesis ought to be low. So it's, once it's packaged this way, 
the argument is just a deductive argument that follows from three premises. These are the three premises. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.